Good afternoon and happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, before I uh, take your questions, I have a brief announcement. On Friday, November 8, the President will travel to the New Orleans area for an event on the economy. The President will discuss the importance of taking measures to grow the economy and create jobs by increasing our exports. More details on the President's travel will be released as they become available. That is my very brief topper. So I go to you. No, I'll have a full week ahead for you at the end of your briefing, Chuck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you remind me. Well, I, we'll remind you. okay. Thanks, Jay. Um, I know the president has been briefed on the shooting at LAX. Can you tell us any more about uh, who he was briefed by at the White House? Anyone he may have talked to outside of the building? And does he have any sense of what actually has happened in this incident? Uh, the President has been briefed on the incident at uh, uh, Los Angeles International Airport by Alyssa Mastromonaco, his Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, and he will be regularly updated uh, on uh, unfolding events there. At this point, the lead is the uh, LAPD, uh, but we're obviously uh, at the federal level in touch with law enforcement officials on the ground, uh, and will, uh, the President will be updated uh, as, uh, as the afternoon progresses. And at this point, anything you can say about what he's been told, what the understanding is from officials on what's happened there? Uh, no, I have no more information uh, than what I think you're learning from uh, reports uh, out of L.A. right now to convey. On a separate uh, topic, intelligence officials say that the leader of the Pakistani Taliban was killed in a U.S. drone strike on Friday. Uh, can you confirm that he was killed? Uh, no, I, you know, as you know, don't speak about operational matters, uh, but uh, you know, I would have to refer you to uh, Department of Defense for that. And, and one last topic. Um, Edward Snowden appears to be reaching out to some other countries for help in trying to get the U.S. to drop these charges against him. Is the U.S. talking to any countries, Germany in particular is one country we know he's reaching out to, to tell them what the U.S. would prefer they do in this kind of situation? I'm certainly not aware of any conversations like that. I, uh, Mr. Snowden has been charged. Uh, with uh, crimes, and he ought to return to the United States uh, to face those charges and, and avail himself of uh, all the rights available to defendants in this country. Uh, you know, the crimes with which he's charged are very serious. And, uh, you know, it's certainly our view that the right thing to do in this case is for him to return or be returned to the United States uh, to face those charges and to have his day in court. Uh, so beyond that, our position is what it was, uh, which is uh, uh, that uh, the unauthorized release of classified information, especially of the nature uh, that we're talking about here, is, is, is harmful to the national security interests of the United States. Do you think it complicates um, for allies like Germany, for example, their dealings with him, perhaps, knowing that U.S. officials had been spying on their communications up to their chancellor? I mean, our view on what uh, Mr. Snowden did, uh, I think, is well known. And uh, when it comes to the tensions caused by the disclosures uh, that have appeared uh, because of those uh, unauthorized leaks, uh, we're handling those issues in our direct diplomatic communications with uh, Germany and other nations and allies. So, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about that, and there's no question that, uh, you know, these are issues that we are addressing, and uh, they go uh, to the heart of the overall review of our uh, intelligence collection uh, activities that the President has ordered up, and it's underway now. See. Was the President aware that some of his advisors were talking about the idea of replacing Joe Biden with Hillary Clinton? Uh, I'm glad you asked, uh, because uh, I, I think it, it's important to know that campaigns uh, and pollsters, uh, part of campaigns, test a lot of things. Uh, what I can tell you without a doubt is that the President uh, never considered that, and had anyone uh, brought that idea to him, he would have uh, uh, laughed it out of the room. I think uh, former Chief of Staff Bill Daley said as much this morning. So. Uh, and here's why. 
Joe Biden has been an asset to this president uh, in two campaigns and throughout five years uh, of this administration. Whether it was handling the implementation of the Recovery Act, handling the very sensitive uh, and important uh, portfolio of Iraq uh, in the first term, uh, or his key role in uh, working with Congress on some very uh, important negotiations, uh, Joe Biden has been an excellent partner uh, in the President's view. And then as a candidate, uh, I think if you look at the role he played in 2012 and you look at the job he did in his debate, I think there is little doubt that he was an enormous asset uh, to the entire cause and enterprise. So that's how the President feels. Uh, and and I, 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 having said that, I think you all know that he believes that Hillary Clinton did a magnificent job as Secretary of State. He believes he made the right choice in running mate. He made the right choice in Secretary of State. Uh, and when it comes to 2012, I think the fact that the President uh, became the first person to win more than 50 percent of the vote uh, consecutively since Ronald Reagan uh, tells you a lot about uh, how effective that ticket was. Saying he was aware of this or was not. I aware? I, I believe. Look, I, I think if you ask the people who who were more directly uh, running the campaign uh, that question, they they might have an answer. I'm not aware that he was aware of it. Uh, well, again, the I know for a fact that any suggestion that people periodically floated in the press uh, that this was something under consideration was not one that he took seriously ever. Separately, Secretary Sebelius t t testified the other day that she did not have reliable enrollment data, but we've since learned that only six people signed up on the first day. Did she not have that data? When well, she what you've leaked? learned uh, from selected cherry-picked leaks from a Republican committee is the, that there are notes out there from a contractor that make estimates about estimates about figures uh, related to <coughs> enrollees in early days of this uh, process. What's important to know is that the website wasn't functioning very well on October 1st or October 2nd. In fact, it hasn't been functioning uh, well in the first month since the launch. And that's why the President's so focused on making sure that uh, everything is done to bring that website up to the standards uh, he has for it. So, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the implication from this uh, disclosure is that the website wasn't working effectively on October 1st. I think that is a dog bites man story. Uh, we know that. Uh, and when we have fully compiled data about enrollment in the middle of this month uh, for October, we're going to release it, which is what we said even prior to launch. Uh, but it's also instructive to remember that setting aside any problems with the website, we knew and told you in advance that there would be low enrollment figures initially uh, because we knew that from experience. We saw that uh, in the Massachusetts precedent, which uh, the President himself spoke about just uh, in Boston. So uh, in fact, I think if you look at what happened in Massachusetts, something like 0.3 percent of uh, what would turn out to be the enrollment figure in that uh, insurance reform program uh, is what they saw in the first month, 123 people. So we knew it was going to be uh, a slow build. It's no question that it's been made uh, more challenging by the uh, poorly functioning website. And that's on us. And that's why we're dedicating the resources and the brain power to get it fixed. Uh, because here, the, the, the central issue here, as we've talked about before, is not can we build a great website. It's can we make sure that the American people who deserve affordable, quality health insurance are able to buy it. And uh, that's why the President is so frustrated by the website. Uh, more frustrated than anyone else, I think it's fair to say. I'm going to do what I did the other day, move up and back, Cheryl. Uh, thanks, Jay. Um, what prompted uh, the climate change uh, executive order this morning? Is there a particular problem that it's trying to address? Climate change. Climate change. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very particular and important problem, yeah. I think this is part of the President's overall effort to address uh, this challenge that, that our nation and the whole world uh, is facing. And uh, he established a task force on climate preparedness and resilience to advise the administration on how the federal government can respond to the needs of communities nationwide that are dealing with the impacts of climate change. And I think what, what's important about this uh, task force is that it's, it's basically tasking 
uh, state and local officials w who are on the ground and dealing with how, you know, how to respond to or prepare for the changes brought about by uh, alterations in our climate uh, and so that they can feed back uh, ideas and, and suggestions for best practices uh, through this task force. So it's part of an overall approach to the problem uh, and I think it demonstrates that, you know, we're continuing to, to, to take it on uh, f uh, from a variety of angles. John. I'm sorry. Yeah, Joe and then John. Oh, do you know whether the numbers from this um, war room meeting are accurate? Uh, six. On I the think first I, the HHS has put out a statement. I think it's been available for since yesterday on that and where it, where they believe it comes from. I think these are rough uh, figures, notes that were sort of a, a snap in time. I, I think as the secretary testified uh, in a hearing, a lengthy hearing uh, the other day, uh, you know we're uh, going to assemble accurate. Uh, data uh, and provide it monthly. I think that uh, one of the reasons why it's important to do it on a monthly basis is to make sure that uh, the data is checked and is accurate. Remember, it's coming in from a variety of places, both uh, via the website and via uh, from states who are running their own exchanges, from uh, applicants who go through mail or go through in-person centers or through the call center. So, uh, I, you know, I, I would refer you to HHS or CMS for, for more on that. Uh, and I think that the whole point and regardless of how specifically accurate those numbers turn out to be, is that uh, we know and acknowledge that the website has been a problem. So you don't and think it, excuse me. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you don't think there's a transparency problem for the administration? On I think what, what Secretary Sebelius has said and I've said and others have said is that we will provide uh, enrollment figures on a, on a monthly basis, which is entirely consistent with the kind with the way that other programs have provided information and the reason to do that is because we want to make sure it's accurate and in this case uh, because the data is coming in from so many different places you need to verify it and make sure uh, that it reflects what's actually happening and we will do that and look let me just tell you now on November 1st we don't expect those numbers to be very high and we never did but they're going to be even lower because of the challenges we've had with the website uh, you know I think if Massachusetts is the precedent that makes sense to look at and you look at what happened in the first month of enrollment in Massachusetts in what turned out to be a very successful enrollment period, uh, you'll see that the first month is going to be slow as people begin to uh, familiarize themselves with the options available to them uh, and then make the choices that they want to make uh, when it comes to their uh, health care. We've been sort of struggling a lot mm -hmm. with numbers right now. The President said the other day that just a small fraction of Americans would pay more do you know what that fraction is? Is it 2 percent, 3 percent? I think uh, what, that's a fair question. Numbers, I, I, I don't have that figure because here's, here's the reality of uh, what happens when you create a market that provides options to the American people. So when you talk about, and this is mostly focused as we've discussed in the past here, Joe, on the portion of just 5 percent of the population that currently uh, is insured under the, uh, in the individual insurance market. Uh, you know, they often have one option, maybe one carrier and one plan available to them. And every year that insurance company can say, you know what, your plan's canceled and here's your only option to replace it. And it's usually a worse plan. Uh, what happens now to those individuals uh, is uh, they now have uh, a variety of options. They have levels of coverage uh, that begin with uh, minimum level benefits that already exceed what they've uh, had available to them. Uh, and then they can choose from bronze, silver, gold, and platinum plans. And they can uh, also then look and see what kind of tax credits might be available to them uh, do, uh, uh, because of their income level. So uh, it's, it's, it's harder to pr predict with precision because a lot of this depends on what choices individual consumers make. And it, the fact that they have those choices, I think, is uh, we have to acknowledge is a good thing. And last thing. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Yeah, you, you've By the talked way, it's before. good to see you here. Good to see you, too. Um, <laughs> Massachusetts, you said m many times that you think it's the proper template. Mm -hmm. it, it was a completely different political climate in Massachusetts. Do you, do you think you're, you're really true choosing the right model? Well, I, I think w in terms of the political climate, uh, that certainly speaks to how the bill passed. And look, nobody uh, would have liked to have seen more bipartisan support for health care reform than the president, and I think as anybody here who covered it knows and can tell you, uh, there was a great deal of effort that went into building a plan that reflected 
not just Democratic principles and, and Democratic ways to tackle this program, but Republican ways. In fact, as those of us who are old enough to have covered the health care debate under President Clinton in his first term, uh, there was a Republican plan submitted at the time uh, that is the closest uh, precursor to what the Affordable Care Act is today. So a lot of the ideas in the Affordable Care Act uh, came from, you know, middle of the road and conservative uh, Republicans. And uh, I think that reflects the President's view all along that we ought to try to build a consensus here. It's regrettable, of course, that uh, Republicans have instead, uh, you know, fought this tooth and nail all the way. They fought it through passage. They fought it uh, through the many pointless repeal votes that they've held in the House and then, uh, you know, challenged it unsuccessfully in the Supreme Court and then ran a national campaign on it and it didn't uh, turn out their way. So what we hope is that in the spirit of uh, everyone's desire to help the American people, re Republicans and Democrats can join together in making sure that the American people who have benefits available to them by law are getting the benefits that they uh, deserve. That's, that's what Democrats did. Democrats who opposed uh, President George W. Bush's Medicare Part D plan, who voted against it. Once it was law, Democrats and Republicans came together when that program had a rocky rollout uh, to make sure that their constituents got the benefits promised by the law. And we certainly hope that lawmakers of both parties will join us in that effort. Don. You said we'll get monthly enrollment figures, right? As I've said, probably a dozen times from okay, this podium. So November 1st, but the uh, rollout was October 1st. We're at the one month mark. How many? And as I probably said a dozen times, John, mid-month, which is consistent with every so program like it. We, do you, we want this data to be accurate. We want it to be compiled. We want it to make, we want to verify it. So, like, this is not moving the ball. We've said all along, okay. middle of November, we'll have October figures. What I really want to ask you about is, uh, <laughs> is Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> did did uh, Vice President Biden know that the campaign was conducting polling and focus groups on the possibility of, uh, of replacing him? John, I don't, I don't know uh, the details of that. I can point you to the people who, have already, who ran the campaign, who, according to the book, uh, you know, had some of this uh, work done and everyone to a person says this was never seriously considered. It was something that the president would never have accepted uh, and uh, the idea was never brought to him. So here, you know, camp you've covered campaigns. I mean, they, they, they poll and focus group on what you have for breakfast. Uh, that's what they do. So, But they usually poll or focus group on something that has an impact on the campaign. I mean, why would the campaign be polling on what it would look like if Hillary Clinton replaced Joe well, Biden. Again, I, I think you ought, ask, you ought to ask. You ought to ask pollsters and 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 those who ran the campaign. What I can tell you is that the president has in a partner uh, in Joe Biden, uh, somebody who uh, has been an enormous asset when it comes to governing uh, here in Washington, and an enormous asset in two national elections when it comes to campaigning. Uh, and I think again, if you look back at 2012 and you look at that moment in the campaign when the vice president had his debate. Uh, it was a key moment, and Joe Biden delivered for the ticket. Uh, I think there's no question about that. So, uh, and that, and the president knew he would. That's why he asked him to be his running mate in 2008, and that's why uh, there was never any doubt among anybody here that he would be the running mate in 2012. Does the president enjoy spending quality time with Bill Clinton? He does. <laughs> this is another thing in the book. It, uh, it says that uh, they did a round of golf, they couldn't get through 18 holes, the president made a comment of he, he likes him, but in doses. Well, again, here, here's two things I'll tell you about the book. One, I haven't read it. Uh, two, uh, I, you know, I'm sure it's filled with a lot of great color and detail about uh, a campaign that, like all national campaigns, is filled with uh, ups and downs and, 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 and turns and twists. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure it'll be a great read. What I can tell you is that the president is uh, enormously grateful for the advice and assistance that he received from President Clinton uh, during the campaign and the counsel he's received uh, throughout his presidency from one of his only living predecessors. And, uh, and, and that relationship has only strengthened uh, ever since uh, the president, you know, then-senator, ran for the nomination against President Clinton's wife, then-senator Clinton. And uh, I think that's, I think you can, you can see how that relationship uh, only got stronger over the years and it's very strong today. I, you know, we were just in New York, uh, the Clinton Global, uh, Global Initiative in uh, September, and, you know, they, they have a very strong bond, and I know that President Obama and uh, uh, that President Obama very much appreciates uh, 
uh, the counsel and advice he receives from President Clinton. Never gets tired of it. Never. Not, not that I'm aware of. John Christopher. We know that congressional and administration officials, including uh, national security staff here at the White House, met with a slew of representatives, EU representatives, earlier this week uh, regarding the so-called NSA spying concerns. Do you have any updates? And do you think that these meetings have improved relations between the U.S. and the EU? I, I think there's no question that the kind of communication we've had with our European allies on this matter uh, have been very important and very useful when it comes to uh, making clear how much we value uh, the kind of security cooperation that our nations have and that we have with uh, Europe in general. It's vital when it comes to keeping Americans safe. It's vital when it comes to keeping uh, our European allies safe. Uh, so as I said earlier, there's the tensions that have been caused by these disclosures uh, are ones that we acknowledge and they're ones that we are addressing directly in our communications with uh, European nations and other, and other nations uh, who have been uh, a part of the disclosures. Tensions have been calmed in any way? I, look, I, I, I obviously wouldn't speak for any European nation or any allied nation, but I would say that we have believed that the kind of uh, communication that we've engaged in uh, has been effective and useful in uh, making clear how much we value those relationships, how important our cooperation and, uh, is when it comes to national security issues and, uh, and intelligence matters, and how much more broad our relationships are, because these uh, these are very important economic relationships as well as national security relationships. Thank you, Jake. Daniel. Yeah. You had a noisy demonstration out front um, by Camp Ashraf folks. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell, tell us how hard is the president going to press the Iraqi prime minister on the issue of accountability for the killings that took place uh, in September at, uh, at uh, Camp Ashraf? Well, as you know, the president has meetings uh, this afternoon with, uh, you know, very shortly with. Uh, Prime Minister Maliki, and uh, you know I'm not going to give you a readout of meetings that haven't happened yet. I'm, they'll they'll discuss a whole range of issues. This is uh, I'm sure going to be one of them. But this is an important relationship, and uh, it's one that uh, in the aftermath of uh, the ending of the Iraq War and the, the withdrawal of U.S. troops remains important, and our commitment remains very strong uh, to uh, Iraq and the assistance we provide them in uh, dealing with their uh, challenges from Al Qaeda in Iraq, uh, the renamed Al Qaeda in Iraq, and, and dealing with their overall economic challenges as they continue to make progress uh, out of uh, out of the past that uh, you know created so many problems uh, for the Iraqi people. What's our current position on, on who was responsible for that? You know, I don't. I would refer you. Well, I, uh, let me say this. I'm sure State Department has more on this for you, but I can tell you that we. Uh, remain deeply concerned about the fate of the individuals abducted uh, from Camp uh, Ashraf, as well as the security of the residents remaining in Iraq at uh, Camp Haria. Uh, we are pursuing these matters actively and daily uh, with uh, UNAMI, with UNHCR, the government of Iraq, and other relevant authorities to seek information on the MEK members who went missing and to ensure as much protection as possible is provided for the residents who uh, are at Camp Haria. Uh, so I'm sure, like, as I said, that you know, these are the kinds of conversations we have with our counterparts uh, as part of a whole array of topics that will come up. Major. Uh, can you be as definitive about whether or not surveillance is going on at the IMF and World Bank as you have been with uh, Chancellor Merkel? Uh, look, as I think I've said, we do not comment on, uh, you know, specific reports uh, about uh, our intelligence gathering activities. Uh, these, all these matters are under review at the direction of the President. And I know that's just a specific sure. report that a decision has been made and that's no longer going on. I wonder yeah, if I, again, I think as, uh, this has come up with regards uh, to we'll different questions. Uh, absolutely, and it's fair. And I can just tell you that uh, all of these matters are under review uh, when it comes to head, uh, head of states, heads of state, and also allied and uh, allies and friends. Uh, there's a special emphasis as part of the review in looking at uh, intelligence gathering activities, but. Uh, beyond that, these the issues that you raised and others are part of this review, and, and uh, when that review is complete at the end of this year, I'm sure we'll have uh, more information that we can provide to you about uh, decisions that are being made uh, and changes that are being made in, in how we collect intelligence. So you can't even say whether a decision has been made about. I, yeah, I just don't have any updates uh, that I can provide. 
Vice President spent two hours with Prime Minister Maliki yesterday, and as anyone who follows the Vice President in Iraq knows, he continues to have phone conversations with all the key players in Iraq. Will he be uh, participating with the President in any post-game meetings, and does the White House sort of view where Iraq is right now at either a crucial or tipping point as relates to the violence and all the other issues, parliamentary elections? I mean, is this a time where that portfolio that the Vice President has carried for five years becomes ever more significant. I think it's a very important time for Iraq. Uh, the violence that we've seen has clearly escalated significantly, and uh, we condemn it in the strongest possible terms, and that's why we believe that uh, we need to work together with other allies uh, and friends of Iraq to help them counter uh, the terrorism being perpetrated by, uh, by Al Qaeda there. Uh, the Vice President's a part of the conversations today, and I'm sure that uh, he and the President will continue to discuss this very important uh, foreign policy matter going forward. Uh, you know, the time for some fresh thinking as far as U.S. policy and what's going on in the post-pullout dimensions of Iraq. Well, I mean, look, we're, we're focused on providing the necessary assistance to Iraq uh, to help them combat terrorism there, as well as the uh, broader assistance that we provide through the strategic framework uh, agreement, uh, and that and that encompasses not just a security relationship, but an economic and uh, and political relationship. Part of this, you know, part of what Iraq has been going through uh, for many years now uh, is the uh, effort to resolve uh, its the political differences and and divisions within that country peacefully and through politics, uh, rather th than through you know violent conflict. I'll, you know. The forces of Al Qaeda are trying to disrupt that, as they have periodically throughout uh, this period. And it's very important that, in spite of the differences that exist politically in Iraq, that the uh, the parties and the and the factions and the groups uh, continue to resolve their own differences peacefully, and which further isolates the activities of Al Qaeda and and demonstrates what they are for all to see, which is. Uh, you know, uh, the wreaking of terrible violence upon innocent civilians that is uh, damaging to uh, every Iraqi. So uh, our assistance encompasses more than just a security, co uh, a level of security cooperation, although that's very much a part of it. Can I ask you to address mm -hmm. something that uh, in this very busy news week has sort of filtered through some of the analysis of the President and his leadership style? As I'm sure you're well aware, and maybe others in the building are, there have been a number of stories suggesting the President has been in not indifferent or a sort of an absentee or lacking a central involvement in things very important not only to his agenda but to his overall projection of power. And I just want to give you a chance to uh, offer the White House rejoinder to some of that analysis. Well, I think I know what you're talking about. I think that the, uh, I mean, I have to just address it specifically. I summarize everything. No, no, I know. That was, it was a good job. But the, um, I mean, let's, 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 let's no, take, <laughs> let's, let's take the, the, the piece that some have looked at when it comes to uh, intelligence gathering. This president is a uh, very deliberate consumer of the intelligence product provided to him, uh, and he focuses on uh, the things that are, uh, keep him up at night, which are the threats to the United States, the threats against the American people, and the threats against our allies. And that means uh, North Korea, Iran, Al Qaeda, uh, and other kinds of uh, threats that are, are direct uh, to the United States. And you, you, you can be sure that uh, he focuses on uh, those issues. And, and, you know, this question has come uh, with regard to some reports, and all I can say without commenting on uh, specific intelligence gathering matters is that when the President wants to know what uh, the head of state of one of our allies thinks, the President calls him or her. The President calls Chancellor Merkel or Prime Minister Cameron or uh, President Hollande. So uh, I think that answers that piece of the question. When it comes to health care, you know, this President has been focused from day one since the passage of the Affordable Care Act on making sure that implement implementation would be carried out uh, effectively. And that includes the, uh, the implementation of the website, which is why nobody is more frustrated by the substandard performance of the website than the President of the United States. And he's making sure that every effort is expended to, make, to, to bring it up to snuff. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, it, you know, the President expects results. Uh, that's the way he manages this White House. That's the way he manages this administration. He uh, believes that smart people ought to bring all their talents to bear to solving problems, but he expects results. Right. 
that. I mean, on the question of the website and some other things, we've asked questions, others, evidence has been raised of things that the President should have known, and either we can't find out if he did know or we're told it doesn't matter whether or not he knew. And on the question you have to be more specific. What we've look, I think you've seen all along that we've said uh, we did not know the. Uh, imagine, uh, of course, we didn't know the website would perform as poorly as it uh, has. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have been speaking about it the way we did. You know, right before launch, two hundred people are on it. Right, and what, and what, what Secretary Sebelius has said, and what uh, uh, Marilyn Tavener has said, is that they were uh, told that the website would function. It would not have. Uh, it would not be error-free, there would be glitches, but that it would function. And it clearly has not functioned up to the standards that we expected, which is why we're dedicating the resources we have and the brain power we are uh, to fixing it. Because in the end, this isn't about a functioning website, it's about delivering affordable health care to millions of American people. And on intelligence, there are many in the in intelligence community who find it inconceivable the President couldn't know of all the things that have been disclosed. And we are told the, the hard things, the hard targets he knew about, the soft targets he didn't. And that just seems to some on the outside not really the way a president would well, organize himself around intelligence. Yeah, I'm not going to talk. I cannot, uh, you know, answer every specific report about our intelligence gathering activities. I think I uh, came pretty close to answering your question when I described the kinds of intelligence that the president focuses on uh, and how he goes about uh, uh, having discussions with or learning the thinking of uh, our allies. Uh, on Iraq and the uh, necessary assistance you talked about, mm -hmm. um, there were obviously some lawmakers in this country talking about keeping some U.S. forces behind uh, mm -hmm. as part of the transition, and the President decided not to do that. As you noted, the violence has escalated. Are there any regrets here about not leaving some U.S. troops there to try to help the situation? The decision to fully withdraw from Iraq was one made by the Iraqi government uh, and the United States government. And it was the right decision uh, because anyone who believes uh, that the presence of U.S. troops, 5,000, 10,000, 60,000, 100,000, in perpetuity is the answer to uh, solving Iraq's political challenges, uh, I think is just simply wrong. And, and, and that's, you know, I think that was part of a sustained debate in the 2008 campaign. And uh, the President was committed to ending the war in Iraq, and he has fulfilled that commitment. That doesn't mean that we don't have uh, an intense and focused relationship with Iraq uh, going forward, including one that focuses on providing security assistance. Uh, but Iraq has to resolve uh, the challenges that face Iraq uh, uh, through, you know, intense political effort and uh, aided by uh, the security forces, the, the, the troops and police who have been trained by the United States and uh, our allies in that effort. and. Uh, through the assistance that we provide them and other uh, friends of Iraq provide them going forward. On Syria, um, some administration officials have privately confirmed that these, these reports of Israeli war planes uh, a couple of days ago striking a military base in Syria. You also read out a phone call a couple of days ago between the President and Prime Minister Netanyahu. W was this discussed on, on that call and what can you tell us about what the U.S. I don't have any further readout on that call and I have no uh, comment on those reports. Um, Vice President Biden on that, not about the book, but looking forward. In your answer, you talked a lot about how they've worked well together and the President thinks very highly of the Vice President, would have laughed off the idea of somebody wanting to take him off the ticket. Uh, does the President believe the Vice President would be a strong President? Sure. Is he ready to endorse I him? think the President picked Joe Biden as his running mate uh, for the right reason, which is that uh, if necessary, Vice President Biden could be President. Uh, that's, I think, the first uh, uh, item on your checklist when you're picking your run, running mate. So, uh, you know, so what happens in 2016 is, uh, you know, something that we'll see in 2016. Yeah, I'm not going to get into 2016. La <laughs> last thing Unless you want to, we could talk about the Republicans. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> Please, Please do want to have that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Please proceed. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. How do you compare uh, Rand Paul, Ted Cruz? How do you? you I think they all ought to run. Okay. It'll be awesome. Uh, last thing on, <laughs> if I got to bring it back to uh, health care. Um, you started out on this question of six people enrolling on day one uh, by saying the numbers were, quote, cherry-picked. Obviously, these are HHS numbers. I understand they're I'm saying the document release, as we've seen again and again and again, okay. in particular from this committee, is, is from you know, select, select, uh, sure. selected documents. So and I'm not contesting. I, like, what I'm saying is that is those are notes from a contractor, as I understand it. Based on, yeah. and, and we're going about the business, as we promised, of uh, gathering all the data, verifying all the data, and we'll provide it. So to prevent uh, cherry picking, why don't you at least put out a reasonable preliminary number uh, and show us some transparency? We're going to put public out where we are. a reasonable 
uh, accurate number, uh, as we promised we would, in, uh, on, on, a mon on a monthly basis, consistent with uh, the data release that you see uh, for other programs. And the focus here, uh, you know, for understandable reasons, uh, I guess, is on, uh, you know, how low the number might be. And I think, it, like, listen to me now. Uh, they were always going to be low, the enrollment figures for the first month, because that's how enrollment periods work. That's how Massachusetts work. That's how probably all the monthly enrollments you guys have on your plans work. Uh, that has been compounded and will be compounded by the, you know, the problems that we've had with the website. So, uh, you know, we uh, expect uh, those figures to be relatively low, but we absolutely expect those figures to grow. Uh, and we always did. And it is our challenge and our responsibility to make sure that we provide uh, for the American people who want this product uh, access to it through the website, through call-in centers, uh, by mail, uh, so that come January 1st and then by April 1st, uh, everybody who uh, wants affordable quality health insurance on these marketplaces is able to purchase it. And, and that's why we're working hard on, on, on the goal here. And the means, uh, the means to the end is only important because the means have to work to get you to the end. Yes. Uh, the president is going to be campaigning with Terry McAuliffe on Sunday. Does the fact that the administration is investigating Mr. McAuliffe's company present a conflict? I was, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure what you're talking about. Investigations are something that uh, aren't handled here. Uh, the president believes strongly that uh, Terry McAuliffe is uh, uh, the right person for the job in Virginia, and I'm sure uh, looks forward to campaigning for him. I'm not aware of the SEC. I didn't teachers. say that. I'm saying. If whatever investigation you're talking about is something for investigative authorities to comment on. Yeah, Ari. Could you just talk broadly about what the President's message on Sunday is going to be? In other years, we've had the President giving a series of rallies and speeches, the message to the American people about who to choose. This seems to be the only rally he's doing this election cycle. Well, it is an off year. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm not saying he should be doing lots more. I'm just saying, given that this is the one speech of this kind he's going to give this year, What's it going to contain? Well, I'm sure he's going to say that Terry McAuliffe uh, is the right choice for Virginia, and he's going to make an argument for why. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you'll have to wait and see. Really? Sure. I mean, like, you don't uh, want to give us uh, any kind of sense? And it's official he's not campaigning with Barbara Bono. Uh, I, I don't have any updates on, on his schedule uh, All right, uh, beyond Virginia. A couple questions. Is it fair to say somebody gets daily updates on enrollment figures in the administration? In terms of the the daily churn uh, of this process, we set up briefings where they can. I understand. Yeah, publicly. I'm saying somebody somebody every day is finding out. Here are the today's numbers. Again, I would refer you to CMS. Might uh, be able to tell you more about that. What I can tell you is what the secretary said. You know, there's. You know, we're compiling data. It's you can't. You know, you need to verify it and make it accurate. It's obviously uh, the challenges in doing that uh, have been uh, exacerbated by the uh, difficulties with the website. Uh, it's. I, I mean, if the what I what wanted I, an update right now, would somebody be able to provide a okay, number? I, I I I suppose that somebody could provide provide a rough estimate, Chuck. But the point is, you want to get accurate information when you release it publicly, and I mean, if the purpose of this line of questioning, which I know. Uh, is of fierce interest to those who never wanted affordable health insurance available to the American people to begin with, um, is to demonstrate that those numbers uh, are low. Uh, we concede that they will be. We said that even before October 1st, before we had the trouble with uh, the website, because that's how enrollment works. If you look at Massachusetts, I mean, imagine uh, what that must have looked like at the time. They roll out this new health insurance uh, reform program, and it's uh, Governor Romney signs it into law, and he's got bipartisan support, and they implement it. And after a month, they have 123 people sign up for it. Turned out that more than 36,000 people signed up for it, but in that first month, enrollment was low. Well, it's going to be low here, too. Uh, but the important thing is that we provide uh, steady improvements to the accessibility to the website and to the accessibility to information and enrollment uh, through the other means available so that the millions of Americans who want to shop for affordable health insurance through, the, through these marketplaces are able to do so. And just very quickly, this rough estimate mm -hmm. that was leaked, this, say, this is federal exchange only. This is not counting state exchanges. I, I haven't even seen the document. You know, Chairman Issa didn't send it to me, so I don't, you know. 
I want to ask about Iraq. Does the President think that the United States has a special responsibility for Iraq's safety? Whether or not he believed in the war itself, does he believe the United States considering The President the believes it's in the, the interest of the United States to have a robust relationship with Iraq and to help Iraq uh, deal with its security challenges and to help Iraq deal with its overall uh, challenges as uh, it makes its way out of you know, decades and decades of uh, dictatorship and tyranny and then a decade of terrible violence. And, uh, you know, that's — it's in the United States' interest to do that. The President does firmly believe that it was the right thing to do to end that war. Uh, and he obviously believed that it was the wrong thing to do to get involved in that war. Uh, but when he became President, it was his responsibility uh, to make sure that we ended that war in a way uh, that protected our national security interests. You keep saying that, that the President does believe that, you know, needs to provide a relationship that helps with security. If the Prime Minister, if Prime Minister Maliki is saying, hey, he's, he needs even more help with security, does that mean the President would be open to some sort of special forces, some sort of troops, or is there a sort of I a don't line? anticipate, no, I don't anticipate troops on the ground. What I think will be a focus of their discussions is the ways in which the United States can provide assistance. We are providing assistance and believe it's important, and we make that case on Capitol Hill. I wouldn't expect any announcements, but when, if you're asking about uh, boots on the ground, I think we've, uh, you know, we made clear that we withdrew from Iraq and we think that we can uh, continue to provide assistance to Iraq in its effort against Al Qaeda, uh, short of boots on the ground, through our, you know, foreign military sales and other, and through other means. The President thinks that Iraq is a robust democracy. Uh, I think that the President believes uh, what is accurate, which is that uh, Iraq is a new democracy struggling with democratic governance. Uh, it's not alone in uh, those kinds of struggles. And it's, uh, I think Iraqis would be the first to tell you it's, uh, it's an imperfect democracy, uh, to say the least. But it's important that Iraq make progress and that it make progress by uh, resolving political differences through political negotiation and through elections and through uh, conciliation and not through violence. Um, Olivia. Uh, kind of building on that, um, the President's always reserved the right to use American military force against extremists when a local government cannot or will not. Uh, there are now uh, Al Qaeda camps in Iraq. Is, is that option on the table for Iraq? I, I certainly don't have any military action to preview for you. I think I answered the question about troops on the ground, but April. Um, a couple of questions. Um, one, New Orleans. Could you talk about the uh, economic situation in New Orleans right now as the President is looking to talk about foreign trade with New Orleans and other countries in uh, around the world? About the uh, specific situation economically in New Orleans, I don't have a lot of data for you on it. I, I think that obviously New Orleans, uh, in addition to being hit as the rest of the country was hit by the Great Recession, uh, has also had uh, significant other economic challenges caused by Hurricane Katrina. And, and this President's been uh, focused on and dedicated to the effort to help uh, New Orleans uh, revitalize itself, and that effort continues. The President's going to New Orleans to talk about the need to increase our exports because increasing our exports helps grow our economy and helps create jobs here in the United States, including in New Orleans. Uh, you know, I don't have a further preview on it. I'm sure we'll have more details for you next week. And I want to ask you this. Um, there are at least two principles in this administration that have great possibilities down the road. <laughs> um, well, okay. You're talking about me again? Yes, I am. Um, so will the President be strategic? Because in, in, a, in any kind of uh, support that he may have. I'm wondering where it's going. Yeah. Okay, listen, listen. Will he, be, <laughs> will, he be, will he be strategic in making kind of any kind of support for any of these principles because they have far-reaching ramifications down the road for one or the other? Or could we see a president who sits out until the general election? April, I, I just I have to tell you, in on November 1st, 2013, the president is not thinking about 2016. He's thinking about what he needs to do every day uh, to make progress for the American people on the economy and on jobs, make progress in getting this website fixed so that Americans can uh, have access to affordable and quality health insurance, Ma you know, making progress in our relationships uh, with our allies as well as uh, in keeping the American people safe by uh, continuing to take the fight to al-Qaeda. So, you know, that's what he's thinking about every day. I'm sure 2016 will take care of itself. This President's run for the last time 
uh, and uh, you know we'll we'll obviously all watch with interest what happens, especially in the Republican Party. So Phil, the Democratic yeah. President does not stand behind the Democratic. April again, I think you're, you're talking. You're, you're you're way ahead of the game here. I, I you know. You guys are strategic. You guys are already. I planning. can promise you, nobody is talking about that in the president's world right now. Yeah, Phil. Yeah. Um, why did the president decide not to campaign for Barbara Bono, Bono in New Jersey? Has she asked for his help, and has he decided not to you go know, there? I, I, I have uh, no information on, you know, the, the president's schedule politically beyond his visit to Virginia Did on Sunday. I, you know, I, again, I don't, I just, I haven't been asked that question in a while. I'll, I'll have to get back to you. Phil. She's the Democratic nominee. Sure, and, and I think he met with her when he was in New Jersey uh, earlier this year, I think it was, but I don't, I don't have any updates on that. You can't that. say whether he supports her. Yeah, he supports her, but I haven't been up, I haven't, I, I, I honestly. That was the question. That was the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were focused on whether he was going up to New Jersey. Yes. Mike Vicara. Then Justin. Uh, so the United Nations back on Iraq has mm -hmm. uh, got figures out today. More than 900 Iraqis, 852 of them civilians, were killed last month alone. Mm -hmm. 5,000 since April. You have repeatedly attributed the, the violence there to Al Qaeda, but there are others, notably some very influential senators, say that. Prime Minister Maliki has mismanaged the situation, that he's fostered sectarian strife there of the type that's plagued Iraq over the course of the last 10 years. How do you respond to that? Well, I'd respond two ways. One, uh, the violence is coming from Al Qaeda and its affiliates. I don't think there's any question about that. When it comes to uh, democratic governance and resolving differences between the parties and factions and ethnic groups and religious groups within Iraq. That's hard work, and, and it's, it's every leader's responsibility in Iraq uh, to make sure that work is done in a way that doesn't foster violence. I think I answered earlier a question about uh, the nature of uh, Iraq's political system, and there's no, way, there's no question it's a work in progress. But uh, make no mistake that the source of the violence is Al Qaeda, and uh, I think that for Iraqis, that is something uh, that is particularly painful, but also illuminating. This is not the product of uh, intra-party or intra-faction uh, conflict. This is Iraq once again, I mean, Al-Qaeda once again trying to destabilize uh, Iraq and take advantage of uh, the instability there. Justin. Jay, on Monday, it looks like the Senate will vote on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act for the first time since 1996, when mm -hmm. it failed by one vote. Um, what's the White House doing to make sure that doesn't happen again? Uh, the President has long supported an inclusive Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which would enshrine into law strong, lasting, and comprehensive protections against employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, and his administration has and will continue to work to build support for it. Uh, what we have seen is progress as that bill has moved through committee and now uh, will get a vote uh, in the full Senate. Uh, the, we're, we're making clear to every uh, senator who may be on the fence or uh, may not have expressed support for it that uh, we f strongly believe that uh, a yes vote is the right vote on this legislation. So we're uh, we're working towards that towards that end. Are you confident that, that it will pass? Well, I would. I I think counting votes in the Senate is something that experts in the Senate do. Uh, we know that it's the right thing to do, and we fully support it. Thanks, Jay. Uh, yes, Chris. Uh, the, the Senate of the Employment and Discrimination Act, if it gets passed that, through that one chamber, would that change the landscape of the President's thinking on an executive order for, uh, for prohibiting LGBT discrimination for federal contractors? If you're, you're asking me to predict whether or not it would pass the, the House if it... I'm asking you if the Senate passed and uh, would that change the President's thinking about the executive order for LGBT discrimination? I, I think that what I would say is that we have long believed that legisla legislation in, in an inclusive uh, Employment Non-Discrimination Act uh, that would enshrine into law these protections is the right way to go. You know, I've had this discussion periodically uh, over the year, uh, and that's still our view. Uh, I'm not going to prejudge what's going to happen in Congress. What I can tell you is that it's come further uh, than I think some people expected a year ago, and we want to continue to see that progress in Congress. That's a no. That's not, that Senate vote is not going to affect the I think I answered the question uh, expertly. Week ahead. One more. Noller. Bernie, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
What do Jay, you got? Jay, you say the, uh, the president's um, not thinking at all about 2016. Guarantee it. Can you tell us what he's thinking about 2014? Yeah, he wants to see uh, uh, lawmakers, elected or reelected, who, who want to focus on the problems that this country has uh, uh, and the challenges it faces when it comes to growing our economy uh, and increasing employment and making the middle class more secure. And, you know, he'll do as presidents before him have done. Uh, get out there and support those candidates, uh, Democratic candidates. He believes, uh, you know, have uh, that as the focus of their agenda. Look, we, the president wants, you know, pra practical progress made in Washington. The American people are crying out for it. They're tired of the kind of uh, dysfunction that we saw during the shutdown. They're tired uh, of the, you know, the, the blame game that they see people engage in here in Washington. They want, they want their elected leaders focusing on them and their futures, not on uh, their personal political futures. And, and that's what the President's committed to doing. He's not running again. Uh, he wants progress. He wants this economy to grow uh, faster. He wants it uh, to create uh, more and better jobs for the middle class. Uh, so that'll be you know, the message he carries uh, in the midterm elections when that time comes. That time is still some ways off. Uh, in the meantime, and throughout that time, he wants to focus on working with this Congress and doing everything he can with the executive authority he has uh, to move, move the ball forward on the economy and on jobs. The week ahead, scheduled for the week of November 4, 2012. On Monday, the President will welcome the five-time Stanley Cup champions, the Chicago Blackhawks, to the White House to honor the team uh, and their 2013 Stanley Cup victory. Following the visit, the President will deliver remarks at an Organizing for Action event. That's Monday. Tuesday, the President will travel to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and visit with wounded warriors who are being treated at the hospital and with their families. The President will also visit the Fisher House, a program that supports military families by welcoming, welcoming them to stay at the house while their loved ones receive specialized medical care. On Wednesday, the President will travel to Dallas, Texas to participate in DSCC events. On Thursday, the President will attend meetings here at the White House. And as I mentioned earlier, on Friday, November 8, the President will travel to the New Orleans area for an event on the economy. The President will discuss the importance of taking measures to grow the economy and create jobs by creating, uh, increasing our exports. We'll have more details. Uh, on the President's travel as they become available. Later that day, Friday the 8th, he will travel to Miami, Florida to participate in DNC and DSCC events. That, ladies and gentlemen, is your week ahead. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, uh, and I'll see you Monday.